As you know, things are very, very uncertain overseas. There's an enormous quantity of uncertainty, and that's why the RAND has been so very weak. Because you do obviously get the RAND weaken as risk aversion when levels rise, which is another way of saying as uncertainty rises. So from that point of view, we have done four scenarios. So given the probabilities, an expected case, a down case, and an extreme down case and that case. The point that we want to make today is that the expected case is one which obviously we think is the most likely. It's one that should happen. But the forecasts that are contained in the expected case, and you can see those in that table at the bottom. That shows you the RAND is a little bit stronger than where it is now, okay? That shows you really that we are tending a little bit more towards the down case. So basically we're saying a 50% probability that this is what's going to happen. 40% probability of the down case, which is global recession. <coughs> and then the other probabilities are obviously much smaller for the other two scenarios. So essentially, we have a situation in Europe, which is impacting very negatively on the rest of the globe, where you are getting significantly debt embattled economies not actually making their payments on the debt and being bailed out before they default or other economies which are on the point of doing this. Okay, so this is really the underpinning of the Eurozone crisis. You've got to understand that before you can actually progress into seeing what the latest developments are and where things are actually going to go. The reason why this is so serious is because the banks in the Eurozone own this debt. So the countries that are debt and battled are Greece, Italy, Ireland, Spain and Portugal. Okay, they're also known as the gypsies, or the gyps, or the pigs, or any different acronym you'd like to make of those letters. But the point really is that those economies are battling to repay their debt. And the reason why they have such high debt levels is because they actually borrowed on the very low borrowing costs of Germany when they entered the Eurozone. The other economies in the Eurozone, such as Germany, France, own these countries' debt. The banks own their debt. So if these countries don't repay their debt when the obligations become due, the banks actually fail. The banks become insolvent. And as you know, economies can't exist, they can't run if their banking sector cannot operate. So that's the underpinning to the Eurozone crisis. And it's quite a severe crisis because the latest communications that we received from the EU summit that it basically said that the Eurozone is looking to help recapitalize these banks. So that's the bottom line. Can Europe repay the debts of these economies that are debt embattled? And some of these economies have debts that run into the trillions of euros, whereas the rescue funds do not even reach a trillion euros on their own. But are they looking to recapitalize the banks, which as you can see are very closely entwined as part of the problem? Okay, if they don't, and these countries default, they don't repay their debts, the concern clearly is that the markets will then stop trading in those bonds, you get a credit freeze, which you had in 2008 in the financial crisis at that point, and that clearly, as you know, resulted in a global recession. So that's our down case, this is our expected case. Our expected case, you can see from this slide, is based on the credit and banking crisis that I've just described, not deteriorating to outright freezing of markets and credit markets, even if one of the countries exit the Eurozone. So Greece, as you know, a while ago was looking to exit the Eurozone, some of the other economies might look to exit. There's almost this expectation that if you actually get a exit, if you get an exit, the Eurozone is actually going to collapse. It's not going to be able to continue to function. Now clearly that's not the case if it's a well-managed exit. Why there's this concern? If you think about it, if you're, you're sitting in Greece and you've got Euros, and you know you're going to go out of the <coughs> Union and actually get drachmas instead, those drachmas are going to devalue massively. So you're going to lose your savings in terms of massive devaluation. So people will obviously then draw the euros out of the banks and try and deposit them in a safe haven, which is what's been happening in Germany. That's essentially what's known as a depositor run on banks, and that's another factor which could cause banks to go insolvent, and hence economies to be unable to operate because the banks have lost their solvency. So these are some of the concerns. So we're saying that if the country does exit the euro, it is likely to be carefully managed, you're not likely to get this depositor run. We're also likely to see the ECB increasing its purchase of the bonds of these countries, and there may well even be some leniency in terms of bailout conditions and repayment schedules. So that's our expected case. The firewall that we're talking about, the rescue fund, which is essentially put together by the IMF, EU and ECB, 
obviously is something which could also calm markets and prevent a massive default. But the concern clearly is that there's not enough money in this fund to rescue all the countries. Okay, so part of this expected case was if we don't get this default, as so I said, and the global economy returns to growth by the end of 2013 reaching trend growth in 2014. So if it returns to trend, it starts to return to trend growth in 2013, it gets to the trend in 2014. And the United States avoids fiscal recession, as you know, the fiscal cliff in the United States. Okay, and then Chinese growth does not um, see a hard landing either. So this is essentially what we've seen so far. We've seen a flux between the risk on and the risk off. Okay, so that's, that's where we've come from. The purchasing car parity of the RAND, I don't think I'm gonna talk you through. I think looking at the sovereign real yields, here you've got the situation where before the Eurozone came into existence, and that was over here, you can see that the yields on these bonds have actually been returning to their roots. Okay, essentially what that means is before the Eurozone came into existence, these yields were quite a bit higher than Germany's yield, the green line. Okay, as the Eurozone was announced, these yields tracked together. As another country joined, Greece, it joined these yields checking together. It just means that all these economies could borrow at the very low borrowing costs of Germany. <coughs> In other words, that's part of the reason why their debt levels increased so substantially. Because it was very cheap to borrow, very enticing to borrow. Government in South Africa was doing a similar thing. Easy to borrow, more difficult to repay. And that obviously has seen these economies get into substantial debt. Okay, there's a political situation from the point of view that if governments have more money, they can spend more on social services, education, housing, <coughs> schooling, social welfare grants, medical care. Does that sound familiar to South Africa? And basically then they can get more voters. Okay, so this is what happened in Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain. This is something that's been happening for hundreds of years in all the different economies of the world. It's something that South Africa is embarking on very rapidly at the moment now. The point really is at some, at some point you actually have to repay the money you borrowed. And this is what's happening in the Eurozone. The markets are now saying that these economies are unlikely to pay, repay the money they borrowed, so they're pushing up the borrowing costs massively. They don't want to really lend more to them unless they're charging a very high interest rate. Germany, as you know, is borrowing costs has dropped very substantially lower because they are seen as a very good bet. Okay, so that's where we're seeing at the moment in the Eurozone. You can see that one of the other concerns is that when these borrowing costs rise, these are 10-year bonds, such as Spain and Italy, where they get towards 7%, the markets themselves believe it's an unsustainable cost of borrowing for these economies, and they in turn will push for repayment, they'll push for default. In other words, they'll push these bond yields substantially higher, and those economies won't be able to borrow sustainably, and then they actually will default. So these are the problems that are very severe in the Eurozone. If the Eurozone <coughs> is going to this downward spiral, likely to precipitate the same global recession that we saw in 2008, 2009, and South Africa is likely to fall into global recession. So we fall into a recession here domestically on the back of the global recession. So this is the down case scenario. The down case scenario, as you can see, has got a weaker exchange rate. Okay, so at our rate, it's not at 805 <coughs> this quarter. When it's actually closer to 815, moving towards this down case, as the rand weakens, you can see the markets are factoring in greater probability of this down case. Okay, so we've talked, I think, through this down case, case quite extensively. One thing to note about the down case is it's likely to be expected to be, a, if it does occur, to be a temporary situation. In other words, the markets freeze and the authorities work very hard to unfreeze them to get them going again, as what happened in 2008. If that doesn't happen, then you're likely to go into global depression, okay, which is two or more years of recession. Some people say that one way of defining a recession compared to a depression is that a recession is when your neighbor loses their job, a depression is when you lose your job. So I think that's something to actually bear in mind. But the point really is it's a terrible situation. It's not a, not a nice situation. It's something that's staring the global economy in the face. And it's a reason why there's such very negative sentiment in the markets. So I think we've talked through all of these points in this slide. This is just to show you that bringing this home to South Africa, when we get that risk off environment, people are, concerned about the global economy, they're concerned that we're going to go into this recession. They tend to sell off the equities, sell off the bonds. You can see the volatility of, of foreigners' purchases of South African bonds and equities. 
when they actually believe at the moment, as they do believe that we are going to go into a better situation because the Eurozone Summit, the EU Summit, has actually had some positive events come out of it that, that finished on Friday last week, showing that we're actually likely to see perhaps not as gloomy an outlook that the Eurozone might be pulling together to reach some of the solutions, then you move into risk on again and foreigners start buying our equities and bonds. So this is the financial markets. Very much a today event, very much something that fluctuates during the day and on the day. It's very, a lot of short-term in, 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 in financial markets as opposed to macroeconomics itself. So we are seeing at the moment, as I said, a bit of a risk on environment. The RAND has pulled back and strengthened a bit. And obviously we are expecting that if this continues, in other words, if we continue to get good news out of the Eurozone in terms of they actually going to finally work towards solving their problems and reduce their borrowing, which in turn reduce their borrowing costs, then obviously we could avoid that down scenario. This is an extreme down scenario that I talked to you about, the global depression. Okay, when you actually move from a recession into a depression, it's basically a complete meltdown. I'm sure you remember the Lehman default <coughs> we saw in 2008, 2009. If not, I think you must perhaps look it up. Because that's something similar which is obviously steering the global economy into the face at the moment. The concern, obviously, as I said, is that the authorities do not move quickly enough to, to unfreeze the markets. And this is a situation where the RAND sees very substantial depreciation. A complete breakup of the Eurozone could also generate extreme downsides now because, as you would expect, you get massive depreciation against all the currencies in the complete break breakup of the Eurozone. Okay, so these are some concerns that we face and given it a low probability of 9%. And the up scenario is important merely for us to remember that it's not likely to return soon. Okay, so there's the exchange rate forecast. I talked you through already. This is the growth expectation. This is the expected case for global growth. Okay, the expected case for global growth really is one. <coughs> I think where you would say that you're not seeing trend growth return. Basically, you're definitely not seeing the boom period return in time. So you're not seeing trend growth begin to be approached before 2013. Okay, so really you only firmly return to trend growth in 2014. Trend growth is normal growth. Okay, growth that you would expect to see from the economy, globally and domestically. I think these slides are probably too complicated. The outlook, as I said, is our expected case. And it's one in South Africa where we believe that interest rates will remain unchanged this year. We likely see inflation stay inside target. And obviously there's likely to be lower pressure from inflation globally because obviously the global economy is performing so poorly. Okay, so that's quite an important point to note because that's why <coughs> consumer price inflation has dropped down. Remember recently it dropped from 6% to 5.7%, much lower than expected. should continue to drop off this year. As we did say, the global outlook looks bleak on Europe's continuing sovereign debt crisis. I was talking about earlier is those pre-programmed spending cuts and tax hikes in the United States, which if they come through, could see the United States economy contract okay, by 4% in the first half of next year. Okay, that could also push us into global recession. We're also seeing poor job numbers and consumer spending data in the US, so we're not seeing the United States economy at trend growth, I think we've already discussed this, but the point really is that there's still a lot of weakness in the global economy, whether it's centered in the Eurozone, whether it's centered in the United States, whether it's centered in China, and these obviously are some concerns. We've got the Federal Reserve Bank's recent decision to continue Operation Twist. Okay, I hope these things are ringing some bells. These are what's always happening in financial markets at the moment, domestically and globally, until the end of this year. And it's the latest, as I'm sure you're aware, in a long list of support that global monetary authorities have given to markets. Whether it's obviously cutting interest rates, which is, I think, one of the simplest forms of monetary accommodation to assist financial markets. Whether it's Operation Twist, which is here a situation where they buy back debt in the long end and sell in the short end. So they don't increase money supply, they don't do quantitative easing, but they keep interest rates low in the long end in the United States in order to stimulate borrowing, long-term borrowing. Okay? 
and that's supportive of the economy. So that's Operation Twist we had before. We're having it again. It's a twist. It's twisting the long end of the yield curve down and the short end up. Okay, we also are likely to see quantitative easing through if we go into the down case, but unlikely to see it if we stay in the expected case. And we've been talking about the strains in the bond markets in the Eurozone, the borrowing, government borrowing, the sovereign debt. We know that Spanish bonds are at the record highs, I'm sure you see it in the newspapers quite often, it essentially means that the markets are starting to anticipate the default in Spain. Anticipate means that it's something you believe is actually going to happen, so you're doing something before the event occurs, which is why the borrowing costs are being pushed up, because once they do default, if you're holding that debt, it's going to be incredibly expensive, because you're going to lose your, your money or part of it. So the point really is that there are many different concerns in the global economy, and South African fortunes, as you know, are closely tied to the global economy, are a very small open economy. The worries, I think, is that if we see GDP growth, we're expecting GDP growth about 25 2.8% this year. If we see the global economy deteriorate further, we could expect to see GDP growth much lower in South Africa. And obviously, that's a worry because it means that we get rising unemployment, more people losing their jobs. We've already seen the the SIGO PMI come out today, I'm sure you know it, 48. Index reading was 48, compared to 53 previously. As you know, the SIGO PMI is a sentiment reading of what the manufacturers <coughs> are looking at. In other words, they're saying that when it's below 50, they like to see production fall in the next six months. Okay, and it was below 50 today, likely to fall. As you know, the global economy has been performing very poorly, so there's low demand by exports. And obviously, they're putting our manufacturers and causing this PMR reading to come out so quickly. So that's the reading that came out this morning. If we do see further weakness, remember that the EU summit was a positive event, but if we see further weakness, then obviously we could see Reserve Bank's concern about the global economy and the South African economy increase. And that's obviously when we like to see the likelihood of an interest rate cut rising. Remember, that's our down scenario, an interest rate cut of 1.5%. Okay, so the FRA curve, forward rate agreement curve, in financial markets, full cost of interest rates. FRA curve is factoring in a 50 basis point cut of interest rates in September. It's 70% chance, it's a very high probability. As we know, for those of you who've been following, the Reserve Bank's movements and the markets. When the markets factor in a high probability of an interest rate cut, and they don't talk it out, the Reserve Bank, there's a chance it could happen. So that shows you how deteriorated the global economic output has become. So our base case is that we stay in the expected case, that interest rates remain low, that supports our consumer spending, as I uh, said about GDP growth at 2.8%, consumer spending at 3.7%. Fixed investment picking up, improved job creation, because South Africa is doing much better. The GDP growth rate is about 5% here, yeah, domestically, than what's happening globally. But if you take in that poor demand for our goods, yeah, which is why I can see PMI is so down, then that is a situation when we obviously have GDP dropping from 5% to 2.8%. Okay, so this is where we're sitting at the moment. I think I'd actually like to break for questions now, because I'm feeling it's a bit like information overload. <laughs>